about we heard what we heard today and what we see on the video. So one of the things I, I did take a couple of notes because we had a lot of heavy topics too today. I mean, the, the, the uh, culture out there is pretty rough. And if you've been around for more than 20 years, you've seen it. 30 years, you've seen more. 40 years, 50, 60, I'm 62. It's blowing my mind because um, like my mom used to say, I didn't think I'd live long enough to see and hear the things that we're seeing and hearing. Um, the last lady, Melissa, who has a, a group they deal with pornography, and uh, I think uh, the one before her, Lisa, she deals with trafficking, and they had talked about how they merged together, and it, it just was blowing my mind. It's so crazy, and everybody talks about the family, and they talked about love, and while these things are good, it doesn't get to the heart of how we can really. Um, fix this problem, solve this problem, or even think about it. So what I want to do today, I want to kind of step out of the box a little bit. Many of you may not be faith-based. I don't know. I am. I'm a Christian. And by the way, my name is Denise Ashurst. Um, this is my son, who's here, Gerada. I have a daughter. She's in Boston. And I have a stepson. He's in, probably working. Right now. He would have really benefited from today's uh, um, event as well. Um, I've been doing Pride and Purity since 2006. My own testimony is um, I was peer pressured at 20 years old. I had relations with a man who wasn't my husband. And I was taught from, uh, I'm a baby boomer, so my parents are from the uh, third, born in the 30s, raised in the 40s. And we had a moral set to growing up. And some of the films that they show today, the two, two parents are working, nobody's at home with the kids, the computers are running amok in the schools. Uh, the other girl we talked about the school system, it, it just blows my mind on what they're teaching kindergarten, kindergarten. So as this thing keeps going and going, it just is really mind blowing for um, me to take in. It was a lie. Last year I thought it was bad. This year was even worse, I guess, as we go, it gets worse. But anyway, um, I went to college. I went to the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandise in California, Los Angeles. I'm from New York. And I really didn't fit in that fashion world. It was somewhat of a dog eat dog and probably a lot of the stuff that we saw going on today was going on there and I was approached a couple of times in an inappropriate way and it made me go home and just rethink. Uh, I graduated at 17 so I really was still a child but you know in my mind I was grown and I could do what I want to do. Um, I went home uh, five years worked with Down syndrome children and I wanted to be a, a physical therapist. Uh, and I just love Down syndrome children. There's something about that left chromosome, they have like an extra chromosome to love. If you've ever been around Down syndrome, they're beautiful children. So uh, my dad was in the Army, my uncle was in the Army, my brother was in the Army, and I was decided what I wanted to do with my life. And my brother said, well, you should go to school for, uh, to be a physical therapist, and you could also uh, be in the military. So I said, sure, I'll do that. So I went down 42nd Street and joined the military, and I was about 90 pounds soaking wet, and the guy said, sis, you don't want to go in the Army. And he walked me down to the Air Force, true story. <laughs> so I joined the Air Force, and I was tested out high in aviation, so I actually worked for pilots for 20 years, and I retired here at Nellis Air Force Base. I knew that there was a calling on my life from that incident that I had with the man who was not my husband, and I said to myself, I wish there was somebody who said it's okay to be a virgin. I just said, and if I ever get the chance, I'm gonna teach that to young girls. I'm gonna teach it to girls, especially in high school, right around that area of sixth grade, going into seventh grade, when you think you know it all, and you wanna try the waters and all that, and I just wanted to be that. So fast forward to 2005, I was at a, um, in California at a retreat, and the speaker said, if anybody felt like they called to do something, raise your hand, and my hand shot up, and I was looking at it like, what? <laughs> your hand's up. But my hand was up, and I knew what it was, and the calling was to work with young girls. I went to my pastor. I didn't know uh, how to start or what. Uh, he just said, get started, just like that. And so I had, a, I, I always say a set of twins, but I think you just say twins. And a set of twins means two, right? So I had twins in my church, and I start with them, and I call them the daughters of thunder because they just went out and they told all the other girls. And we've been doing that word of mouth since 2006. Then I, it was a little quiet here in the United States, and I don't know why it's like this in the United States, but it wasn't until we went to work in Belize 
Now, did anybody go, well, why are you working over there? Why are you not doing anything in the United States? So then the doors started open here, but we do travel. So I'm going to tell you a little bit before I get the film going, because we're going to jump right into the discussion after that. Pride and Purity started in 2006. It's a, a program where we take six hours, six academic hours to teach the girls. It's either two hours for three consecutive Mondays, or two hours on Friday night and four hours on Saturday morning, you get the idea, six hours, however that pans out. They have to graduate after the purity class because I believe in finishing something. A lot of the kids today don't finish, they start something they don't finish, so that's the first step of finishing. Once they graduate, they receive a purity ring, a devotion, which is just a book that teaches them how to continue to walk that way, and then they start community service. Because the kids are so into themselves today, when you start serving others, you come outside of yourself. And one of the things the girls love to do is feed the homeless. I don't know why that is, but they love just talking with them, and I think they feel empowered, and they, they feel a sense of worth. So we do that. On the spring break, we go somewhere in the country so they can get out of the you know two-mile radius that they grew up in. And so many kids never get outside of uh, the small area. And in the summertime, we'll go somewhere overseas. Uh, Ms. Deb works with me. We just got back from Guatemala. And the girls down there, just they just had a good time. I think we had about 50 in the class. And that was actually a small class overseas. Uh, we've been to the Philippines, Jerusalem. We are from Belize. We've been to Belize quite a few times. So then, uh, fast forward to me. I don't know how. Oh, I know how I met Akira in um, CARP. He just found us on the website, and he said, we're having a Valentine's Day program. Could you come over and talk about purity? So I did, and he said, I'd like to interview you first to see what you're going to talk about. And he said, I only got 20 minutes to talk, so you know, we could wrap this up real quick. And two hours later, I was here, and I, it was my first uh, co-ed class, actually, with guys and girls uh, from the campus. It, it was just amazing. And not all of them were caught. They just were were uh, kids that actually there were adults, all different cultures that came in. There was about maybe 50 to 60 in that class. But that was our first co ed class. And I did the same exact thing we're going to do today. We're going to look at a film and we're just going to talk about what we heard about today and about purity. And before she got, hits that film button, Lisa or Melissa talked about three things that was important to her. And I can't remember them off the top of my head. But they were important things like power, love, and I think it was money, money, power, and something else she had mentioned. But I want to say, I think it's a deeper issue than that. I think it's lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Out of those things, everything that we heard about today flows, and it's all about self. It's all about self-gratification. And then somebody had a, a, a slide up just before we came into here, and it said, start a new beginning. As a Christian, I do believe in a new beginning. It's called being born again. And being born again, it's a spiritual thing to where you're outside of yourself. Like, we, we, you talked about love, Kaylee, which was beautiful. And we talked about family, which is beautiful. But you've got to even go deeper than that, and it's God. Because he changes our heart. Our main scripture, do I have it on, is Proverbs 4, 23, and it says, guard your heart, for out of it flows the issues of life. And with that, hit the button, and we're going to look at this film that some friends of mine put together with me. Over 8 billion people are, and the one thing they all have in common is the ability to make choices. God has given us free will, which boils down to choosing good or evil obedience, or disobedience. Free will gives you the ability to mold and shape what kind of person you are. It's inevitable that you will make life-altering choices. So think first before making decisions. Choose to do what is right. Loathe what is wrong. No matter what the cause, know that the choices you make will affect others. But most importantly, know that the choices of others will affect you too. Stop and ask yourself, what is purity? Purity is a state of mind that is clean free of contaminants, something holy and sacred. Most think it means abstinence, just say no. But I say, abstinence is making a choice when you're in a situation. Purity, on the other hand, is living a lifestyle refraining from getting into a situation where you have to say no. 
said, well, she always looks at horror movies all the time. So her state of mind really is always in fear. She, you know, jumping every two minutes because of what she's letting in her eye gate. And today again, with all the statistics that they gave and the things that the kids are going through today, if they're looking at pornography at five years old because they have a device, like Lisa said, you know, somebody's given this computer with no guidance on what to use, what do you think their mindset is? And these are, these are little ones. We're not talking about grown men that can make choices if they want to do that or not. These are the littlest ones. And that's why 
why we decided to start working with the littlest ones, well, at nine, anyway, nine to 99. So state of mind is something, it, it's what your mind is always on. And for the most part, I think if you get to the older age, teenagers, it's always on them and what they can do for themselves. One of the things that didn't come up today was suicide. What, what, do you, what kind of state of mind do you think a person who, which is an epidemic now, by the way, yeah. is, is committed suicide? What kind of state of mind do you think that they have? What, just thinking about why would somebody commit suicide? What, why? Hopeless. Hopelessness. Mm -hmm. Well, the lack of, right? No connection. No connection. Yeah. No connection. They're not doing this. It's it's uh, somebody in the earlier this morning. I don't know if you heard this morning. They talked. She talked about Miss Sarah, uh, Doctor Lorden. She talked about uh, people are in love with their phones because that's what they talk to all the time, or they're in love with their cars because that you know what they you know all about, and that was pretty good. So that's telling us that we're going a wrong way. The, the choices that we're making at the youngest ages are, are not right. So this is the question we throw out of class too. Everybody's doing it. What is everybody doing? Give me some examples. What is everybody doing? Selfies. <laughs> Selfies is the number one answer. <laughs> what else? Drinking. Drinking? So how many in this room, I probably guess, is over 40? Is it probably, oh, is that okay? Have your mom ever said, if everybody jumps off the cliff, are you going to jump off too? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, you know, and so everybody's doing this, but everybody's not doing that, really. And are you going to follow them, whatever they're doing? So does that mean that you have to do what they do? Can anybody give me an example of something a place that they followed somebody in their path that they didn't want to go and it led down the wrong way. That's being a little raw and honest. <laughs> Anybody? Shame very 
I think shame, uh, it's real, uh, real, um, I guess you could say, uh, uh, valuable shame. Mm -hmm. there, there's something valuable about shame, uh, the right kind of shame, at the right time. Mm -hmm. It's a valuable thing, and it turns us away from bad behavior. And I just think it's rare now. We, I think we uh, are trying to shield kids from any kind of shame at all. We don't want them to feel bad about their behavior at all. So. Now it's to the point where kids do anything at all, even adults do anything at all, and you feel no shame for it. And where has shame gone? The Bible has a scripture that says we've forgotten how to blush. And I, I love that because it's true. We don't feel ashamed of anything. And when you don't feel ashamed, you're pretty vulnerable, really. You, you're, you're out there because everybody's doing it, you have to do it. And you feel almost pressured to do it. Because why, if he's doing it, she's doing it, how could that not be right? So, how, so how, what's the answer to that? How do you get around not following the crowd, so to speak? Because you have to surround yourself with it, what you want, because whatever you're around, you absorb it. Mm -hmm. That's really good, because that leads me into the next one. Who are your friends, and how do they influence you? Who are the people who are hanging around you? Do they want to see you excel? Do they encourage you, you know, in the right things? Does anybody have any friends that are pulling them down? or? Want to go the other way? Is that a good place for you? <laughs> <laughs> or are you the type of friend that you try to bring your friends up? Because you could go either way. You don't have to always be the follower. You can be the leader. And if you don't have the friends that are that way, then be that friend that helps others be like-minded, you know, and try to be better. Just because it's legalized and acceptable in society doesn't mean it's right. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the minority now is the ones that are um, faith-based and the ones that are totally not good for society. As we can see the breakdown, um, those, are, those are the majority and their voices are way louder than ours and that's just kind of sad. I think one of the speakers just now talked about those with influence with money. Um, everybody watches the news right now. We have this thing going on where these people pay for the kids to get into college. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. The consequences. I mean, the, the some of them said, I did wrong, really remorseful, and some held back. I don't know if the, the lawyer said to hold back or not, but now they're being indicted for something even stronger. And I looked at this one lady who was, who was on like this family values show, I don't know her name, but I can't imagine her being in prison. And right now, I guess they're giving them value for themselves because she realizes, wait a minute, it's the consequences. You, you know, God gives us free will to make any choice we want, but it's the choices, it's the consequences of those choices that are really going to mold and shape you of who you are. I mean, I could have went being exposed to the environment that I was at 20 years old now, that wasn't even high school, 20 years old, so there's still peer pressure as an adult, yes. is my point. But I could have let that take me a total different way in life. I could have got on drugs, you know, and I, and I think it was the Lord himself that was saving me to do this. And I think it may be that because I could have went that way, and I have friends that did go that way and have died from drugs. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I, you know, I'm not anybody special, anybody perfect, but I did listen. And I, and I said, I, there's got to be something to help me be a better person. To you know, to, to 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 make the right choices. So I have another question for you. What's on that one? That one. What when I say the next generation, what does that mean to you? You smile. What does that mean to you? The next generation. Or what is a generation? You should be about hundred years. Yeah, it could be a hundred years. Okay. Some people look at it as um, maybe like a grandfather, yeah. father, son, or so 20 years or so. Is that, is that right? Okay, if I said this may be the last generation, what do you feel about that? From all that we heard today, could that possibly be? Well, if they listen to that one guy, like, stop reading. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's really black, yeah. But when you say the last generation, the last generation who will what? Oh, 
other that we are imploding. Because we were not created for these things. Our bodies were not made for drugs. Our body wasn't even made for meat, really. We were vegetables and water, probably. Fruit and vegetables and water. What were you going to say? I, uh, I, was, I was thinking of uh, different uh, empires in the past. You know, the, the, the Romans are no longer here anymore. But at the time, they were everything. And they ruled the world. Uh, at one time, there was a last generation for the Romans. Mm -hmm. uh, they, were, they were suffering the consequences of their decadence and their immorality brutality of what they were doing, and they reached a point where it all came crashing down. The Babylonians, the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the Egyptian culture, where, where is it today? It's gone. You know, you see, we look at these ancient uh, civilizations that, that were very powerful, very wealthy, very influential. They, they had reached the peak in their day, and where are they? They're gone. And America is not immune to that. We are not immune. Venezuela, beautiful country that's at the at, at the end. So it's possible. You know, I think as Americans we think we're we are untouchable in that way. That you know nothing could ever you know bring down this great country. But we're imploding almost. It's us who are tearing down our own country through our choices and the consequences of that. And I know that um, we'd like to think that there's a cure for these things that are happening today. We're talking about marriage, pornography, and trafficking. Um, I don't think so, outside of Christ. I don't think there's no answer, because it, the answer is the individual. If we don't individually change our heart, and I, I really love your talk today, you made a decision to live a life of purity. That's a hard decision, and I'm sure when I was in school, you know, you were what they call RAS. You know, everybody's like, what it, at the time, are you gay? Are you this? Are you that? You had something had to be wrong with you <laughs> because you wanted to do right. So what is it going to take to continue to do right to save our little part of the world, our sphere of, of influence? What is it going to take to do that? The next generation. <laughs> Hopefully, right? Yeah, yes. generation. So we, we almost have to scratch the adults in a sense yeah. and start working with the little ones. Oh, yes. um, I know you weren't here today earlier, but they, we had uh, parents to parenting was speaking. And she, was, she, uh, she told us th these are facts that are happening in California right now in kindergarten. Yes. Sex education. And I can't even repeat the things that she said that people are telling our children to do. And they've grown up in this mindset. That it's okay to. I'm sorry? And that it's okay to. And it's okay. The parents are not doing anything. And the kindergartners are talking about sex education. They, they don't even know what to eat from one moment to the next moment, let alone their little body. But then again, with the devices, they're growing up in this tech, technological age. Is getting into their little eye gates, and their bodies are starting to feel a certain way, and they don't know what to do with that. So, what is it that we need? And I put to you a savior, who has already came, who has already died, and has already rose again, just for us. Whether you believe in that or not, it is true. And he so did that for us because he loved us, the type of love that only he could give us. And added, what he left for us is the Bible. Does anybody have a Bible? Because if you don't have one, I have one for you today. <laughs> I have a gift for you today. Because I will put to you that, that if we want to be serious about change, that is the only way that we're going to be able to change. That is the only way that we will get to a next generation. Nobody wants to think that our country is imploding all you have to do is listen to what they talked about today. The people who have the upper hand are not our friends. They're exploiting women, they're exploiting children. That's, that's 
abortions. I think we're the 100,000 this year. So where is the next generation coming from? And, and you know, it's these little conversations like this that may seem hmm, kind of hokey or too spiritual, high, high, you know, pie in the sky. But this is what Christ has done for us, and he did not leave us alone. Everybody has heard of the Bible, right? It's, it's, we, we as Christians believe in the Bible. And we, there's an acronym that, um, I don't know where it came from, but I like to use it in the purity class. Bible is spelled B-I-B-L-E. Does anybody know where I'm going with that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you know the acronym? Can you say it? Basic instructions before leaving earth. Basic instructions before leaving earth. All of us will leave this earth. Rather than close now or later, we are all dying. Can everybody agree on that? Yes. Where are you going? Where are you going? If I'm wrong, we're all going to hell and that's fine. If I'm right, somebody's in trouble. God has left us instruction to how to live, how to make choices, and how to uh, get around the consequences, the traps. That are, that are just laid out for us. And there's many of them out there. So we were talking about uh, today at church the other night. And Dave, you remember what you had brought up about choices? You remember what you had said? Good and evil, rather? The question is, what is good? And we're going to go to the question, what is evil, but what is good? Can anybody, anybody give an example of what is good? Well, we, we, have, we have talked about how there, all around the world, no matter where, where you go, no matter what culture you're in, everybody has a sense of the rightness or wrongness of something. Um, men do not take women that don't belong to them. You don't do that. You don't, you, don't, you don't take things that don't belong to you. You don't go into someone else's house and take their things and walk away with them. That's stealing. And all around the world, nobody nobody needs to teach that. It's a it's an ingrained thing in all of us that there's a sense that that in all of the world there is things that are good and things that are bad. Where does that come from? How do we all have the same sense of rightness and wrongness? And I think our discussion is the point where there is a, a creator of all of all of us, all mankind. We're actually all brothers and sisters, and we're all created by the same God, and he implants in us a, uh, a software program. Yeah. There's a software program in everybody. And some of it's really clear, and, uh, and, and there's some things that aren't as clear, but he wrote, a, he wrote them all out for us in 10 easy lessons, you know, love the Lord your God, don't worship idols, don't steal, don't murder, don't lie. Don't commit adultery or fornication. Honor your parents. Those kind of things. These that sense of, of the rightness of things. And, uh, and it, it goes across the board. Everywhere you go, there's that same sense in every culture. And I think that's a, a very powerful thing that people just need to be reminded of. That uh, um, those are right things and they ought to be held up in our society. They ought to be honored. Um, adultery should be met with shame. It really should. It's not. Today, not enough. Fornication, it should be met with shame, but it's not. It's, that's wrong. I, I think that a good, a good, healthy shame at bad behavior would really help our culture a lot. I think that women in particular have a have a lot of power to change our culture. And that is by rewarding men for good behavior with their affection. I think if, if women are choosing good men, to, uh, to bestow their affections on. And, and leaving the bad guys out in the cold, <laughs> more men would behave right. <laughs> I think that women have a lot of power in that regard. Some more culture shift. Culture shift, yes. A culture shift. Um, bad men should not be rewarded by good women's affections. You can quote me on that. Write <laughs> <laughs> that down for me. Like, oh, I bought a little gift for everybody today. And I want you to open it right now, because this is what we're talking about. In order to change our world, it's going to take more than conferences. It's going to take more than churches. It's going to take more than 
CBD to make us feel good. <laughs> it's going to take to be born again. It's going to take a new life. And we believe in the Ten Commandments in the sense that this is what we call the law. And the law only brings you to a place to say, I'm not perfect. And none of us are. Because nobody can live up to this. I can't. I, I, I can't live up to these. But the lack of this is what we see out on the screen. Because people don't have a, a foundation of any faith, for that matter. They just believe everything is right, and I'm going to do it. If it feels good, do it. I think there's a, a slogan out there, just do it. We've gotten away from God, the way that he created us. Pure, holy, not, not perfect. We're on the side of heaven. It's not going to be perfect. But we can choose to do right. Every day, you make choices. And, you know, I had a hard time with that film because I really didn't want to do the food, the apple, and the hamburger. But it really works because you should eat right. You know, you shouldn't eat, you know, a big old burger slumping over. And I know that's fun because we all do that. But at some point, it's as simple as choosing an apple over a hamburger. It really is. So my question is, where do we go from here? I made the choice myself. I can't force anybody, it's not mandatory, but to live that type of lifestyle, it has to be a force that's bigger than we are. There's no way that we could do it within ourselves. We, we just don't have the ability because we could be pressured, we can be tortured, you know, and you can be duped, coerced. I think, yeah, they talked about being coerced into doing something. So if we're, if we are serious, really serious about a change, we have got to go back. And like the film said, not everybody believed in the Bible, our, our founding fathers, but they all believed in the principles that were in the Bible. And if you, if, if you have a Bible, which you will have one, this, there's a book in there called Proverbs. And I don't know if you've heard of that. It's like the young person book. Because it, it just tells, I mean, everything that you're doing, it tells you what to do and what not to do. And not that you don't have to do it, but you have the choice of doing it or not doing it. And that's where we're going to change our society. That's where we're going to change our culture. They have everything in school except the Bible. There's no balance. They have everything in school other than a book of morals. There isn't that. There has to be a, a, a turnaround at that level. If there, if that, like that lady was teaching on the, the schools in California at kindergarten, teaching them to use a banana as a sex toy in kindergarten, we can't have a Bible. Something is wrong. Something is real wrong. And like uh, David said, we've seen the Romans fall. We've seen the Babylonians fall. We're seeing Yemen, Venezuela. It could be the United States. We are, we are not going to escape this by conferences. We are not going to escape this by just, you know, talking about it. We're not going to even escape it by just making the right choices in our own life. But uh, I was just going to say the contrast of Israel that follows God that was set apart because of their heart for God. They were no longer a country in God, made them a country once again, which has never happened in all of the civilization. Why? Because they, when they fall down, I mean, they weren't perfect either when they fall away from God, from those other gods, then they cry out to God, <laughs> and he restored them, you know. So if, I think if our nation would turn back, our hearts back to God, he'll, he'll restore our nation too, you know. Absolutely. It's a choice. And it starts with each person, it's not, um, he's, he says, if my people, not everybody, Believes, but if his people, you know, repent and, and seek God, and that He will heal our land, and, and um, you know, we see the brokenness. You know, we should be we crying out to God yeah. on behalf of those that truly don't know what they're doing because they've been duped, they've been yeah. lied to, they've bought. You know, with Hollywood, look at what they're they're trained. Like, you know, you can have sex with whoever, and it's like um, they'll they'll uh, be like. Uh, the what's it called? The Leave It to Beaver or whatever, you know, that old fashioned oh, family, yeah. the right, family right. unit and stuff. We try to find that. <laughs> so naturally, you know, really careful. Um, but, you know, that's like old fashioned. 
we have to get back to those morals that we as baby boomers have. It's not perfect, but it's it, protection it, against the it's protect, it's like it said, the Bible is, is not rules or regulations, it's love and protection. And if you don't see God as a protector, then we're lost. And we have to be able to know that there is something that's bigger than we are, for sure. Our creator, and he is, but he's loving. That's the main thing. And you know, we could all go down to the, which I'm sure that room is packed out, <coughs> because it's, it's almost <coughs> hearing it is almost interesting to hear about porn pornography and trafficking. It's interesting. This is not interesting. When we do purity classes, we're not packed out. And the truth never is. When you live that lifestyle, it may be a lonely lifestyle, but it's a good lifestyle to live a life of purity. Going against the grain, I'm not, it's, it's hard. It's not easy. But at some point in time, you have to decide, this is what I'm going to do, and this is what I'm going to stick with. Because it takes individuals to change their life. There's no other way. Does anybody have any last words that they wanted to say or any questions for Deb and I? Well, I think outside of just, uh, you know, uh, religion, if you don't believe in religion, I think you can just start at home. It's what you watch. The majority of the stuff that we have on TV is wrong. Mm -hmm. And when people think it's every single show, it's even the news. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you don't have that, at, you bring it to the workplace and drama starts at the workplace because you miss it. What you, what you want is what you become. It's true. Yeah. Everything is wrong. Well, you missed the slide. She had the dirty dozen, is what she called it. It was parenting, parenting, I think. Okay. Linda okay. was sitting next to me. She goes, that's everything. That's on my smart TV. All these people are involved in pornography mm -hmm. and promoting it. And they, and they were the, the, the people that you see, that you watch Netflix, uh, uh, United Google. Airlines, who, was on, who else was on there? Google. Google. Verizon. Verizon. It was shocking. Everything we use Everything. So if you're in this bubble of evil, how do you get out of it? Because it seems like evil is winning. It really does. I mean, when you watch that today, you just go home thinking, there's no hope. But there is hope. <coughs> but like Narada said, even if you don't have a religion base. I gave you this to, I'm the messenger. I can't change your heart, only the Lord could do that. But I can plant the seed. But what you watch is important. What goes in your eye gate? When that's in there, like that little kid said on that film, he watches porno all the time to where he can't get it out. And he wants to be released. We call it a prison of want. It's just, it's, he's locked in his prison and he can't get out. And that's where bad consequences, too. They put you behind cells, even though you're walking freely. You know, we talked about suicide. They're in a prison. That's not a happy life. They're locked into something that they can't get out. I was there. I, I, I venture to say all of us were there at some point in time, and you cried out for help. And either with a next door neighbor or a friend, I cried out to Jesus. And I was freed from that. It's not that I'm, uh, I'm not, um, what do you call it? I'm still vulnerable to it. I can still do. But every day, it's a battle, but it's a good fight. Every day, I wake up and I say, I'm going to do the right thing. It's not a perfect, no way. But if we as individuals could just take everything that we said today and think about it. I have a gift of Bible to you. You can read it. You don't have to read it, but I guarantee you one day you will <laughs> because that's where we're going to where there's, there's no way out and there isn't. We already see that today. If you would, um, I'll give you one on the way out. I think we're ready to, for our next. Yes. Boy, those minutes went fast. Yeah, I did. But thank you. Yeah, why don't we give a big hand?